Okay, so the, the second part is going to be different. Um, the first part was standard, I mean, sort of. Um, so, um, things that you can find, I think, uh, more or less everywhere. Uh, the second part actually is not. Um, I'll start uh, by describing how to find AGM. So, AGM is all over the place, and so, um, how do you uh, select samples of AGN in the various bands? I think it's important because it gives us a, a view of the various uh, processes, physical processes. And then in the uh, second part, um, I'm going to switch gear. So from review to uh, talk, and I'm going to present you some uh, uh, recent results of our group on a topic which is very important for this lecture, which is the issue of the uh, uh, red wire dichotomy. So I'm going to uh, give you a simplified version of a, a research uh, talk. And I'll then conclude um, very briefly, so opening the way to Deborah, uh, on the, uh, with the big picture. So uh, why are AGN important, even if you don't work on AGN? And then at the end, um, just to tell you that we don't know everything about the jazz, so there is plenty of work for young uh, students like you, I'll end up with what I think are uh, the uh, main open questions in AGN research. So, um, how do you find AGN? Sounds like a trivial thing to do, you look at the sky and you find it. Well, it's not as simple as that, of course. Um, first of all, if you want to do any statistics, I'm going to be very... Um, um, how can I say? Strong about the fact that uh, most astronomers are blissfully unaware of selection effects. And that's an important thing you should always keep in mind. If you want to do things properly, you need proper samples to study evolution, the function that we saw earlier. You need flux limited samples, which means you need to find a sample of sources where you are sure that you see everything down to a given flux density limit. So you need to be very complete. So you need to make sure that your selection criteria gets you most of the AGN, where the most is in quotation mark, as many as possible. And it's also reliable. You don't want to be contaminated by other classes of things for which you don't care. The main point of the second one of the two main points in the second part is the following. And please write it, you know, big capital letters in your office. Different bands give us different views on the AGN physics. You cannot compare samples selected in the radio with the infrared, with the optical, with the X, because you're going to be looking at mostly different sources, at least the bright fluxes and they're going to give you an angle which is really depending on the band. And just to make sure that you get the point, that every band has its own limitations, and so whenever you see a paper discussing some sample, you need to be extremely um, aware about the selection effects. And again, I see everything in the literature. I mean, people mixing apples with oranges and getting anything they want and of course the results are completely meaningless. So, now I'm going to walk you through the whole sky. So we're starting from the radio sky to the gamma ray sky and I'll tell you how you find the GN, what are the pros and the cons of the various bands and this stuff you don't really find normally in the literature. It's the distillation of my thoughts over the course of the past 25 years. Um, so, you might find bits and pieces, but not in this form. So, in the sky you see things like this. Uh, uh, big, uh, non-thermal uh, jets, uh, wiggles, and so forth. And here, this is what I'm saying, this is the optical galaxy at the center. Here you realize that these jets are really huge. They can reach 100 kiloparsecs, in some cases, the megaparsec scale. So, as I said earlier, radio is synchronous emission, electrons moving very fast in magnetic fields. 
this is back to the radio loud, the radio quiet, the radio weak thing. Uh, I guess people working on AGN know the famous Veron safety and Veron catalog. Every couple of years, uh, these two astronomers, French astronomers, they publish a catalog of all the AGN they find in the literature. The latest version includes 170,000 AGN, and uh, I did a cross correlation, and about 19,000, or 11% of them, have a radio detection, typically uh, down to a few mini Jansky, and they say what the mini Jansky is in a minute. So, roughly 10% of the known AGN have radio detection. It doesn't mean that they are radio loud. They are detecting the radio band. Now, every band, unfortunately, as you might know, has its own uh, uh, parameters, way of classifying, of using, uh, you know, uh, defining the frequency, the energy. So in the radio, we have Jansky, and this is the definition of Jansky, and the method minus 23rd, Hertz per square meter per, uh, per second per Hertz. So, uh, in the radio speak, uh, anything above one Jansky is strong, anything between a mini Jansky and a Jansky is intermediate, and once you are below the mini Jansky, it's weak. Just to give you an idea, at 1.4 gigahertz, which is high frequency in the radio band, the, current, the currently, um, the deepest radio field reaches 15 micro Jansky. That's the deepest people have been going into the radio band. 15 micro Jansky. So, Jansky strong, mini Jansky intermediate, and below mini Jansky three. Just rough classification. Sorry? Double uh, no, crash it doesn't handle it. It's like, it's like magnitudes. Uh, an optical <coughs> magnitude brighter than 12 is bright at any ratio. I mean, the source is bright. So, uh, below 25th is faint. And then, so, it's, of course, well, we depend, yeah. You see what you mean? Yeah, it will depend on ratio, but once you're looking at the sky, uh, a Jansky is a Jansky. Okay, so, um, the, the first thing that people do when they have the samples, what they do, they do number count. You count your sources as a function of flux density, and you build uh, number counts, differential number counts. So unfortunately, what radio astronomers do, they normalize by Euclidean. Uh, I have to explain you this. Um, Euclidean number counts are the number counts you get for a non-evolving population where the volume squares like the cube of the distance, which is true only uh, up to uh, a small depression. In a, so, if you work the math, it's very simple. Differential number counts will have a slope of, we call it the flux to the minus 2.5. So what astronomers do, radio astronomers, they take the number count, divide them by Euclidean, so in this plot, flat is Euclidean, differential slope of minus 2.5, going up is steeper than Euclidean, and going down is fatter than Euclidean. So we have to get used to it, I did, uh, but it's, it's one way of doing it. They are the only ones doing it, I don't know why, but uh, that's the way it is. So, and this is, these are the number counts in the radio band, uh, down to, as you can see, about 20 microjansky. And what do we see? As I said earlier, what people know is that once you are, okay, this is microjansky, so this is jansky and mini jansky. Once we are about the, micro, the jansky level, we, the radio sky is made up of the classical radio sources, so radio galaxies, radio quasars uh, with jets. And then, once you go uh, down here, you have um, different population coming in. And I elaborate on this in the second part of the talk. Uh, below the Minijansky level, uh, we think, actually we're sure now, that you have terraforming galaxies, which emit in the radio, and also we have many of the radio quiet AGN, which are not radio quiet, but are radio weak, and being intrinsically less powerful than the radio, once you go really faint, they could to appear. But that again, this is the second part of the talk. So, in radio band, and I picked the frequency about one gigahertz just for reference, we can distinguish the sky in two regions. So there is uh, above the mini Jansky level, to select sources, you have to do something really simple. You just look at the state AGN. You look at the sky because 
basically all the sources above this flux density limit are going to be AGN. There's a tiny contamination by terraforming gases, but that's it. So this is the only band where you have a radio telescope, you take images of the sky, and they're all AGN. All of them. All the radio loudness. Remember, the things with the jets. So it's in a bias selection in the sense that it's all AGN, but it's a bias selection because you get a subclass of AGN which is not the majority. You get uh, many blazers because these things are strong in the radio because they have strong jets, and they are the ones <coughs> who like don't thermal emission, they are elliptical, host, and so forth. Below, uh, the bias is said no, because yet you see everything there is, you see it, but it's a window on a particular type of HM. Below the mini Jansky level, the situation becomes more interesting, and again, I'll expand on this in the second part of the talk, but there, to select sources, you need lots of data. Remember that classification of AGN requires multi data. This is even more true here, because here you have stuff forming gases, and you need to separate them from the radio quality AGN. And I'll show you how you do that in practice later on. So here now we are sampling both the radio quality AGN, which are the majority, and the radio quality AGN, but their fraction is decreasing. Why? Because the radio quality AGN are intrinsically bright, when you go very faint, you're running out of them. So the universe is finishing. And you see the number counts later. Here there are some biases because, as I said, you need to be able to separate the stuff gas from the AGN. And if you have an exit detection and the exit power, it's easy. But anyway, the main point is that you're reaching the radioactive AGN and without obscuration bias. What do I mean by that? I mean that. While in the optical, you have the obscuring torus, and so you, when you, the, the torus like this, you see the cipher twos, like this is cipher one, radio waves go through anything, and so here you see everything, cipher one, cipher twos, because the radio band is not absorbed. So it's a nice, clean way of getting a sample of radio quiet AGM without any dependence on the angle. Clear? Back to our friends, Antonucci and Miller. This is the radio band. We are now moving to the infrared. I have to be fast, otherwise we won't get to the gamma. So, remember that we have the black hole. The black hole is emitting UV emission. And when you're looking at the torus, you see UV emission, the blood lines. But the UV emission, of course, is also going to the torus. So the dust gets heated by the strong UV emission of the disk. The torus gets hot, it emits in the infrared. And so if you do the proper radiative transfer, it turns out that this thing, this dusty torus around the AGN, is going to be about between 100 and 1,000 Kelvin. We have a black body of this, uh, uh, of this temperature, which means that the peak of the emission of the torus is going to be between 3 and 35. Very simple, near infrared. This is radiation, which is absorbed by the torus, UV radiation, and then re emitted in the infrared. So, um, when you look at the SEDs again of, of AGN, and this is from a colleague of mine, Evan Piazzinaul, who is Greek, by the way, and this is the SED from 0.1 to 1000 micro. And what this group has done, they look at the observed points, which are the red points, and they try to separate the contribution from the torus using a model which is, at this point is relevant. So what do they do? They fit a torus model. As you can see, it picks about 20 to 30 miles, as expected. But as you can see, there, there is more stuff there. There, are, there is emission and in the far infrared band. That's uh, a Star Wars component. Stars are also strong UV emitters. There is dust around the star forming region. The dust absorbs the UV emission from the stars. It re-emits it in the infrared. Since the temperature of this dust is less than the torus, the emission is a longer wavelength, and so it's in the far infrared. Okay? So already a, a, an important message. The torus, so the AGN, the dust around the AGN, 
is going to be uh, peaking about 20 to 30 microns. Of course, there is emission even at 2 or 1,000, but the peaks is there. Why the starburst component is going to be peaking at, in the far infrared. And then for CETA2s, we actually you see those galaxy, then it's going to be a, a telecompilation component uh, uh, which you know, starts in the optical UV and then decreases in the real So the problem of the infrared band is that everything emits in the infrared, unlike the radio band. So in the infrared, you get stars, you get galaxies, you get the GMs. So the, the key point on the infrared is to try to, uh, of course, because we enter in the AGM, to separate the AGM from the rest. And uh, you can do it sort of somewhat. Why? Because this is, again, a spectrum uh, between 1 and 10 micro. AGM tend to form a power law. Uh, old galaxies tend to, as you, as you saw earlier, the, the flux drops there. And start forming galaxies have this uh, PAH feature, they're called polycyclic atomatic uh, hydrocarbons, which results in these uh, uh, bumps and wiggles in the, in the infrared plot. Now, based on this, people have been using IRAC colors. IRAC is an instrument of Bohr's Pizza, which is an infrared uh, uh, telescope. I'm going to cover in many missions, so I have to explain what these various missions are. So, this is IRAC, IRAC colors. So, IRAC has four bands, and you can make a color color plot, this is 8 micron divided by 4.5 micron flux, times 5.8 divided by 3.6 micron flux. So, um, a power law in this plot is going to be like this. So, we expect AGN to fall in this. Star forming galaxies are going to fall in a very broad band up there, and all galaxies down here. So, the answer is it's a mess because various objects are going to be all over the place. But let's see the time realize that this so-called laces wedge, which is indicated there, where most of the sources there actually are AGF, for various reasons, which are at this point irrelevant. So the message is that there is, you can isolate a region in this color color diagram where most sources are AGM, but only at all, uh, I've actually said here, yeah, but then you might have some high resistance star forming galaxies there. So it's not an easy thing. So, to summarize the infrared band, we have good news and bad news, like everywhere. Um, the infrared band is sensitive to the emission of the torus. Torus emission is more or less isotropic. It doesn't depend if you are sitting one, sitting two, because the torus is always there. So, you are actually sensitive to the emission of the dust, which is around type 1 and type 2 HM. That's the good news. It doesn't depend like uh, an optical spectrum which is really biased and only shows you the, the broad line. So, we actually are sensed to the really, really extremely obscure DGNs, where there's tons of dust, and you certainly miss them in the optical, as I'll show you in a minute, and also in the soft test. The bad news is that it's very hard to select a decent sample, because the selection methods are, are not very reliable, in the sense that you get contamination from known AGNs, and also not, not very complete. You know, it's hard to define a flux density, flux limited sample in the near infrared. To give you a feeling for this, this is a Stern et al. Uh, based on WISE. WISE is a, a telescope which is which has done a known sky survey in the uh, infrared in four bands. And, uh, they realize that if you make a cut at 15 magnitudes in this band, which is uh, 4.6 micro, and then you take this color cut, so anything which has uh, a, color, a, a color above 0.8, actually, it turns out that it's uh, a 95% uh, an AGN with a completely level of 80%. So you are missing only 20% of the sources. And this is uh, shown there. But the same group shown that if you go fainter, fortunately, your completeness and reliability level goes down. So it's very uh, manually dependent, and so it's hard to get a sample which, which you can actually do. Uh, you can do it, but you need to be uh, aware of, this, of these limitations. OK, we all love the optical band because our detectors peak in the green. And so we think that the optical is great. 
and I keep telling my colleagues, the optical band is the worst place to do astronomy because it's absorbed by anything. Anything in front of it is going to absorb it, not to mention the UV band. So the optical UV band was very popular in the 90s because uh, so people had, people had uh, ground-based telescopes and they knew how to select sources with UV access and they built all this large sample of craters. But then, with time in the light, it was giving us a really biased view on AGN. Why? Because of what I said earlier. In the optical band, it's easy to see with UV access. You only see the sources which are facing you, so you're seeing down the torus, you only see the broad lines, you only you don't see obscure sources. So people had the illusion that in the 90s, 80s, that all places were, uh, were very bright in UV and, and the wires were not, were not uh, obscured by dust, which was totally wrong, of course. So I spent only one slide on the optical UV band. Uh, it's good because it picks the broadline sources, obviously. You're seeing the toes down there, and you see all the quasars and the secret points. That's it. The other problem is that stars are also like bodies, and uh, look at our sun, they emit strongly in the UV and the optical band. So once you want to pick to select the AGN from all the other UV emitters, it's not easy. This is a classical uh, PG sample, 1986, green, Schmidt and Hart. And as you can see from here, only 9% of the sample uh, were extragalactic and the quasars were about 5%. So it was a UV X selected sample, but only 5% of the objects actually were quasars. And the others were all sort of uh, uh, dwarf stars and blah, blah, blah. So by definition, uh, the optical UV band, and this is, I say, lots and not all. For a, in, for a reason which is going to be clear in a minute, of the obscure the GNs. Obviously, because these things have a strong dust and you don't see the black hole. You might see the narrow lines. So, if you have a no three selected sample, then you can actually see the secret tools. But this is was a lot of work. Okay? These people started from a sample of 20,000 sources, IBAN selected took spectra with Demos for all of them, got the O3 power, and they came up with a sample of 213 type 2 AGN. So it's an indirect thing. You can do it, but uh, it, it's, it's not easy. Because by definition, the optical is going to be strongly absorbed. A little bit of oscuration, but your source is gone from the sun because, because it's going to fall below your flux limit. And also, whenever you have AGM where the galaxy is actually strong or the AGM is weak, it's gone again because UV access is going to fail. There are two good things. First one, and this goes back to the question that uh, I got earlier, this is the band to study accretion disks because the accretion disk is going to be in the optical UV band. And the second one, uh, that this band, in combination with other bands, the near infrared, it's good to discover uh, IRH equations. This is a plot by Willow et al. These are uh, Z minus J magnitudes versus I minus Z. Now, the I band is borderline optical. It's 8,000 ohms, so it's a stretch. But anyway, it's almost infrared and infrared. But they, what these people did, they looked at tracks of quasars with radio dry shift, and they realized that in this region, you are sensitive to only more or less to quasars about redshift 6. And indeed, the quasar that I told you earlier with the highest redshift, 7.1, were discovered thanks to a combination of Sloan and new kids. So optical near infrared uh, and near infrared uh, data. OK, so I've done radio near infrared optical. We are left with x ray and gamma rays. This is very fast, but what I care is the main concepts, I mean, which are actually, I think, very simple. OK, and maybe some of my colleagues in the audience will disagree with me, but I think the X-ray emission, we know where the radio comes from, where the infrared comes from, where the optical comes from, where the gamma ray comes from. The X-ray emission to be is still the band where we are not 100% sure where the X-ray is coming from. The idea that is most popular is the following. We have the accretion disk, 
as we know, the accretion disk emits UV photons, and there are some very uh, relativistic electrons at high temperature, a pinion Kelvin up there, and remember the, the, the self Compton emission? These are, they have a lot of energy, and they give energy to the UV photons, and they boost them in the X-ray band. So we think that there is a corona of magic uh, electrons over the disk, and this corona is producing the X-ray emission. Again, my colleagues might disagree, but I think this is uh, not really uh, nailed down completely. Um, so, uh, the good news about X-ray emission is universal. Every AGN emits in the X-ray. It's about, accounts for about 10, 1 to 10 percent of the relative power, so it's not negligible. It varies a lot, which suggests that the emission uh, actually is quite small. And as it goes back to the question I got earlier, indeed, they know the GN are somewhat stronger than the X-rays because on top of the emission from the corona, it's related to the accretion disk, whatever, then you also have the jet emission. Now, again, another notation. Uh, here we're using KEV, Kelvin, uh, kilo electron volt, sorry. And one KEV is 2.4 times 17 hertz. Just for your information. So, excess astronomers don't use hertz or Armstrong, but sometimes Armstrong normally is key. Um, this slide actually comes from a colleague of mine, which is uh, 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 a diesel as well. And I think uh, it shows uh, very nicely uh, an interesting thing. It's the fact that the X-ray band is really good to measure the absorption between us and the AGM. Now, X-ray astronomers use that so-called NH, which is the number of hydrogen, uh, hydrogen atoms uh, in units of atoms per square centimeter. It sounds complicated, but if you have a number density, so which is atoms per volume, and then you integrate over the line of sight between us and the AGN, you basically sum it all up, and you get from a number density per unit volume to a number per area. So NH means the number of atoms in a unit area between integrated over the whole path between us and the AGN. So this plot is going to show us that whenever we have a type 1 AGN, so remember, we're looking down the torus, the, the view is unobscured. Let's say that in this case, we're going to have a power law. This is EFD, if EFE, which means that an alpha x of 1 is going to be a, a, a horizontal line. So let's assume that the intrinsic spectrum is, uh, in nu of nu is flat, alpha of 1. And so you see in the whole thing. Then you put some absorption in front of it, uh, 10 to 20 seconds. I'm going to give you here the equivalent absorption in the V-band, okay? You can calibrate it. So already this is equivalent to five magnitudes. So if you have a source which was 15 magnitude in the V-band, with this an H, it becomes 20. In the X-ray, you barely notice it. This is scale 1, 10, 100 kV. You start losing a little bit of soft X-ray energy, uh, photos, because they are the ones which are most easily absorbed. Let's go up. Then to the 23rd, part of 10, IV is 50. Your source is gone from your optical sample. Because even if it was 25th magnitude, sorry, even if it was 10 magnitudes, 15 magnitudes, now it's 65. And we done the, re the record holder is 32 AB in the Hubble uh, water deep field. So it's gone forever from your optical sample. In the, opti in the X-ray, yes, okay, you're losing a few photons uh, up to 3 or 4 kV, but you still see the photons at 10 kV. Now comes the interesting thing. We're putting now more and more material. Now we're above the so-called Compton thick limit. Doesn't matter, the details are irrelevant. 10 to 24 atoms per square centimeters, 80 or 500. So in the optical, it's really gone. And now, you still have some emission about 3 kV, plus you have some reflection. We think 
that the, the X-ray photons are going to go bouncing off this absorbing material, and you see the uh, iron line, which was mentioned yesterday, as present uh, in the X-ray spectra of uh, X-ray binaries, for example. As well. Now, an interesting point. This sounds like a lot of uh, social, right, x to the four atoms per square centimeter. Uh, it's equivalent to the human chest. So if you have an alien like us falling into a black hole, the AGN is going to become completely once the guy actually covers the black hole. So this shows us uh, that we live in a very special place in the universe because the universe is empty and only on Earth you can have 10 to 24 atoms per centimeter in a such a small volume. Okay? Here we're talking about the integral between us and, you know, I shift uh, one, two, whatever. So, the good thing about X-ray band is that the amount of absorbing material actually can be derived uh, from the X-ray spectrum in a, in a decent uh, and simple way. In some cases, uh, the classification that you get in the X-ray band is not the same that you get in the optical band. So, there are cases where you see a silver one in the optical band, you go to the X-ray, there is absorption. And this means that uh, the X-ray and optical regions are not exactly the same. Um, it's a complication. Uh, overall, it's OK. But it's important to keep in mind that the way you call an object a type 1 and type 2 uh, might depend also on the band you're looking at. So to summarize. Um, the X-ray band is sensitive to uh, the more obscure region, especially in the hard X-ray band. Remember, the, the hard X-ray photons, 10 kV or more, are the, one, the last ones to go. So they are actually sensitive to, to really uh, uh, region. It's reliable, uh, very reliable. These are V number counts. Now, these are integral number counts, the way that the X-ray astronomers do it. So you're plotting X-ray flux, the number of sources above a given flux limit per square degree. And this is the deepest, uh, uh, the channel of the south, which I'll get back to in, in a minute later, the deepest uh, ever observed X-ray field in the universe. And if you look at the 2.8, 2 to 8 kV, uh, these are in blue, you see the AGN, in red the gas is in green the star. You see that the, even down the limit, more than 80% of the sources are actually AGN, which is pretty reliable. In the soft band, you see that the green things are the stars, and at high X-ray fluxes, the X-ray sky is contaminated, at least from my point of view, by stars. Because stars, uh, as we heard yesterday, emit also in the X-ray. And how do you identify them? Uh, it's pretty straightforward now. You, you use a variety of things. Uh, the X-ray power, which of course you need a uh, spectrum, and redshift. Uh, the X-ray spectrum the variability and the ratio between the X and the optical, so you can pick out the AGN uh, relatively easily. Um, I say more than news because there are no really bad news. Um, to be able to see the really obscure AGN, you need sensitive hard X-ray emissions, so emissions which are sampling from the 10 kV above. And until now, we didn't have one, now we have new star, which was launched uh, last year, and it's covering the 3 to 79 kV band, and it's a factor of 100 improvement respect to previous emissions. Uh, it's still not comparable to Channel XMM in the same band, but it's going to be a major improvement. The first papers are coming out as we speak. So watch out for new star if you want to really see what's going on in terms of detecting the most obscure AGM in the world. <coughs> OK, gamma ray band. We're almost there at the end of the spectrum. Um, in the gamma ray band, there are so few detections that we actually count them exactly perfectly. We know that there are, thanks to Fermi, which is this uh, satellite which is flying as we speak and is scanning the sky continuously. There are 1,873 sources detected also by about 100 MeV. Remember, the, the key EV was 2.4 times to 17, so MeV is 2.4 times to 20, and GeV is going to be 24 times 23 
So the, the, the deferred <coughs> parts. So they take above 100 MeV, and in some cases they go up to 100 GeV, which is really, really large. Okay, the optical band is at the 14 to the 15 optical MeV. So this is a factor of uh, 10 orders of magnitude stronger, higher in energy. This is the old sky uh, distribution, uh, and this is the breakdown in terms of sources. So what do you need? We see that uh, blazers are ruling. They make up almost half of the detections. There are some variety sources, and there are many classified sources in which we think of blazers. So blazers make up between 60% up to 90% of MEV, GEV, down the sky. And interestingly, interestingly enough, uh, the gamma ray sky looks like the really bright sky. Lasers are really strong radiometers, and they dominate at the uh, Jansky level. And we find them again in the gamma ray. Why is that? Because in both bands, it's jet emission which dominates. So in one case, you have synchrotron emission. In the gamma ray band, you have synchrotron self quantum the same electrons pushing the synchrotron photons all the way to the gamma ray band. So it's the same beasts with same non-thermal machines. And you, for ironically, because the radio and the gamma ray are the opposite ends, you actually see the same source. Um, this was the GEV. I mentioned earlier that the AGN actually is the TEV band. Okay. The TEV band is 10 to 26. And this is down from the ground. I know who's familiar with the Cherenkov telescopes here. Can you raise your hands? OK. I need to explain it better. Uh, so to make a very complicated life, uh, story uh, uh, simple, you have these fat TV photons coming from the source. And luckily, it gets stopped by the atmosphere. Otherwise, we will be dead. And uh, interacting with the atmosphere, the uh, photon produces uh, pairs, electron and proton pairs. The, the pairs interact with the atmosphere, and they produce gamma ray photons. And the photons produce pairs, and the pairs produce photons. So you get that it's a cascade. And every cascade, the energy of the, of the gamma ray photon decreases. And so if you put an optical telescope at the end, you're detecting in the optical band the emission of the gamma ray photon. Clever, really clever idea. Extremely complicated, but my colleagues tell me that based on the optical photon that they detect, they can tell me the energy of the photon which was hit in the atmosphere and its uh, position, so we, where, where it was coming from. And there is a, an online uh, um, page, which is called TEFCAT, and the number of sources detected so far is 145. That's not a lot. But I still remember when the first source was detected at the TV band. It was 1999. The first source ever detected in, in the TV band by this technique. So in 14 years, it's 10 sources per year. Not bad. And again, look at it. This is slightly different. So we have a lot of galactic uh, sources, pulsars, and the blazers are still there. And they make up about a third of the TV gamma ray span. So. In fact, so in the gamma ray band, the selection you do it by, in this case, the case of Fermi, you have a Fermi uh, position with a narrow box, which is typically not very small. And what you do, you try to identify the gamma ray source. And you do it in various ways. Uh, you can do it with variability. So say that the source varies in the gamma ray uh, in sync with the optical near infrared. So you, you think that, uh, you're sure that the two sources are the same thing. In many other cases, what you do, you do a maximum likelihood uh, probability, and you identify the source which is most likely to be the gamma ray source within the other box. So, um, as you might have understood by now, you get mostly blazes. I mean, you got only blazes, okay? And again, so it means things moving really fast, small angle, and blah, blah, blah. And just to give you an idea, these are ACDs of some Fermi blazers. And here you see what I'm, I was talking about. This is radio, gamma ray, this is the synchrotron part, and this is the, the synchrotron self quantum part. And so it's the same beast, so it's a non thermal jet which is producing both. Which is why the gamma ray sky looks very similar to the radio bright sky. 
Now, uh, what biases do we get? Blazes are your auto GN, so we only get a lot of GN. However, this is not a bias because, in my opinion, we will never see a required GN in the gamma ray plant. Why? Because, as I said, the gamma rays come from the jets, and the required GNs don't have jets. Because the jets are there, they're really, really pure. So, it's a bias, but not a bias. We are, you see, in my, again, in my opinion, all the GN you will see. And also, it probably, you know, the highest energies one can think of. TV photons are pretty, pretty, you know, strongly energetic. Okay, so I hope you're not there after all these um, bands. And there's still the second part of the talk, which I try to uh, do quickly. But I like the big picture. And so when I gave this talk the first time, I said, wait, wait a second. How many, what's the surface base? of AGN in the various parts. So how many AGN per square degree have we ever detected? This is unbiased, so I, I, I never, it's only, only shown that uh, during my talks. So this is showing the AGN surface density, not number of objects per square degree, as a function of frequency, again, radio to gamma ray. And I did my best. I looked at all this, the samples and found the largest surface density in every band and put it there. Now we could give a conf I mean we could have a, a conference I think for a week on a, on a plot like this because the numbers you see, see they are a combination of physics, demographics and technology. Uh, it's hard to catch a hard X-ray photon which explains why in the hard X-ray band the sensitivity is so low. Now when new star this is going to go up at least by a couple of orders of magnitude. In the radio band, uh, we have the telescopes are on the ground. You can build them a little cheaply. And now we're going so faint, we are seeing many that require the GN. So this point has moved up recently. Uh, in the soft X ray, soft X ray is really uh, because uh, detectors in the soft X ray band are actually very good. We have channel XMM. And because all AGN emitter. So this uh, plot, as I said, it's a very interesting combination of AGN physics and instrumentation. But the best of the following that the, 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 the winner is the actual band, and it's about 20,000 AGN per square degree. Now, the number by itself, how many AGN are there? Uh, I did the estimates, if this is published using uh, radio samples, and I get um, the same value. So in terms of surface densities, we, with the X-ray, we are reaching, I think, the limit of detecting all the GM that are to be detected. Now, the field where we take that is time, okay? It's 0 0.1 square degrees. So you multiply by the area of the sky, and there should be about 800 million AGN in the universe. And if you put everything together, we know about less than a million. So people working on AGN, there's plenty of work to do to find out the remaining 799 million. And so plenty of PhD thesis and all that. OK. Um, I promise I'm going to tell you um, the answer to this. Uh, and I will. I might shorten a little bit because I don't know if you if you are tired or what. Uh, but um, I want to go to the end of uh, of the the talk and also discuss about the big AGN feedback. But um, let me then remind you what the problem was. That uh, yeah. Just a clarification for the previous uh, plot. You were talking about all agents, not only radio loud ones. Everything. Everything I could find. So the X-rays here come also from the jet and the disk. Oh, it's the jet is the jet is negative more. Most AGN are required, so when you go to the soft X-rays, the they disc. are already required. It's the disk. So, as I said, every band gives different physics. So this is all together. So this down here we have the jet. Uh, part the jet here are mostly required now, and this there. So it's all, all combined. 
So the pass over the phone Sorry. already. Why is it uh, upper limit in the near infrared? And is that because of the depth of? No, because as I said earlier, every infrared sample is never complete. So you know you're going to miss something. So I put an hour there. Because simply because of that. So we know, as I said, that the radio emission from the beast there come from the jet. And we didn't know until recently uh, about radio emission for the radio which I remind you are the most common types of AGM. So for 50 years, we didn't know what was powering radio emission in the most common AGM. Of course, astronomers are really inventive. They came up with the various uh, possibilities. Uh, the first one uh, is obvious. I mean, when you look, uh, you, took, you look at the VLBI, there are people here doing uh, radio, radio observations. You look at very high resolution and radio telescopes and some of the seatbelts. You see that at the center there are small mini radio routed GN. So the idea was radio routed GN are simply a scaled down version of the radio routed ones. Uh, Schopen Alexander. In 91 actually did this plot, which is really interesting. The same as before, but now we have the, the fan infrared power. If you plot radio power, there's a fan infrared power for radio and radio OTGN. You find radio OTGN up there, a factor of a thousand stronger in the radio, which is fine, but radio OTGN fall in the same region as star forming galaxies, which, as I say in a minute, also emit in the radio. So Schopen Alexander said, why not say that? Radio emission in the quality GN is due to the same processes which is powering star forming galaxies in the radio band. And it was dismissed many times in the literature by saying it's, uh, it's a fluke, uh, it doesn't have any meaning, uh, and it's, it's wrong. And then there were other ideas, uh, and that these are not important. The point was that we still don't know, we didn't know what was powering uh, radio quality GN in the radio band. So I mentioned the Chandra Diffie South, which is one of the most studied areas in the sky. This goes back to Riccardo Giacconi, Nobel Prize for Physics in 2002. He had the idea of taking Chandra, which was his creation, and had Chandra stay at the same spot in the sky for a long time. Initially, it was one megasecond. Ex astronomers count time in megaseconds. So one megasecond, now we're up to four megaseconds, which is which means that Chandra has been staring at the same part of the sky for one and a half months with interruptions, but the total integrated time is one and a half months. But this is the deepest X-ray well, image there is. And there are Franklin fields, and the Hubble Atlantic field is there, and this is part of the two Goods areas, and Goods is the Great Observatory's Origin Deep Survey. So the message is tons of data, ground-based, uh, a VLT, Subaru, uh, Spitzer, IR, NIPS, whatever. So it's, it's full of them. Our radio data are sent there, and we didn't set up to study the, this in the radio to, to solve the issue of the quality of the It was a sort of a classical serendipitous discovery. We just wanted to study the sources in the radio band. And this is the image, and the main match is that we have a complete sample of the sources which go down to uh, 40 microjunks. Remember, the limit now is 50 microjunks, so it's one of the deepest fields ever done in the radio. Remember the number counts I showed you earlier? So up here we have this strong radio, uh, regular DGN. And remember that this shape means steeper than Euclidean, which means evolution. These things are evolving. And this we're seeing here the evolution of quasi radio gases. Then we have a fast drop, but below one mini as you can see, there is a flattening. And people have been debating this flattening and saying that it was all due to star forming galaxies. And we show that this is not true, there are uh, many AGN uh, down there as well. But the point that we are trying to uh, figure out what sort of population we're talking about, a very faint radio fast. Now, I mentioned star forming galaxies a few times. I know there are people here working on star forming galaxies. What are they? They are normally spirals or, or interacting galaxies, and they're forming lots of stars. As you can see, they're all these knots 
Augusta Fomi regions, and they are non-active galaxies, which means that the AGN, there is either no black hole, or more likely the black hole is not doing anything. Like our Milky Way is a classical example. As a black hole, the black hole is not accreting, and so it's a classical star forming galaxy. It's a spiral and it's not active. Why do they emit in the radio as well? This is an in optical image, an image of MD2, which is a, a prototype a starburst galaxy. It's a game, synchrotron emission, but in this case the electrons are accelerated by the supernova by the, the shocks in supernova elements. So uh, the same physical process, synchrotron emission, but <coughs> while in the radio loud EGN is the jet, which is accelerating the electrons, here are the shocks in supernova elements, and the power you reach is much less. This is typical radio loud quasars go up to 27 watt per So these are naturally not very strong in the radio band, which means that when you go faint in the radio band, you're going to see them at very low frequencies. The sizes, this is the optical uh, scale, the galaxy, and the radius, of course, tracks the stuff from the radius, so the size is actually small. And they are blue, and uh, unlike ellipticals, for example, which are, of course, radically optical. Um, before I tell you uh, what we did, uh, I need to give you another brief uh, historical uh, flashback. The way that people were identifying surveys in the past uh, is very different than the way we're doing it now. I'll give you two examples. The 3C catalog, the one where 3C23 comes from, was a radio catalog selected in the 60s to 70s. Uh, third Cambridge catalog, in the radio band, Tenjansky and above, thought and the sources, the typical counterpart at the magnitude between 18 and 19. The image says, it's an extra example, old sky, selected in the 90s, it has identified sources, a typical counterpart, 16 17. Very bright, so I know the guys who did the image says what they did, they took 10 years <laughs> of their life, they put a spectrum over all their extra sources, and they classify them. AGN, normal galaxy, stars, whatever. You can do it, you need a lot of time, you can do it. Nowadays, uh, our village uh, survey reaches about a factor of 50,000 deeper than the 3C, and the channel with south is about a factor of 10,000 deeper than the MSSS, which means that the optical counterparts are actually much fainter. The sample become much bigger. But, the, but if, you, if the area is small, then the numbers are not very different. So, what does it mean when you have a faint count? First of all, you need to go to the VLT and get to get the spectrum because these things are quite faint. But even when you get the spectrum, in many cases, it's very noisy and you can't get the certification. But even if you have a spectrum, the optical band, as I said earlier, it gives you a bias result. So it can give only limited information, especially for sources which are strongly absorbed. There are sources which in the optical look like normal, boring galaxies. You go to the X-ray band, band, and you see an AGN coming through. So the method is that even if we had access to the spectrum, the optical spectrum is not enough. Again, another message to bring home, which is the following. If you want to classify sources properly, you need tons of data in all way. So um, we have our 20 sources, and this is the magnitude distribution in the R band. The median is 23rd magnitude, and we have it here down to 26. These are detections. Some things are not even detected in the other. Anybody who has experience with optical telescopes, you know that when you have 25th magnitude, you go to the VLT, a few hours, if you're lucky, you might get some emission lines. But that's really tough. So we can do, even if we have the spectra, we can do that. We need to use other methods, which is the fact that light on the fact that we have all these optical, infrared, 
X-ray data. Now you're getting tired, I'm going to go a uh, bit faster now. So, the message is, the first part of this talk, I talk to <coughs> different bands, rivers, different windows. Here, what I did, I put that into practice, and I used everything we knew about the sources to pick the AGMs in the various bands and put them all together. This is what, what we did. Now, the way we did it, uh, I'm going to spare you, and uh, I go very quickly. I just said that we're going to use the X-ray band to select the following galaxies, because only AGM can go above this value. We're going to use the radio for infrared correlation, because we know the star-forming galaxies follow that. And we're going to use, to fine-tune the classification, the IRAC plot. So, you <laughs> ask me, and we have a method which allows us, with some caveats, to, to pick, out, pick out the star-forming galaxies from the AGM. And then, with the AGM, we have also a method which allows us to classify the radio quiet from the radio loud. The details are irrelevant at this point of the day. I'm just going to show you the number counts for our sources. Now, where I show you the number counts in different colors for the different classes. So, this is the total. You see the flattening, which was shown and well known below on Minjansky. You see that the following galaxies actually are increasing, and they overtake the AGN only below 0.1 mini -jansky. So there are many AGN below 1 mini -jansky, and the forming galaxies overtake AGN only below that. And a radio quiet AGN overtake the radio loud AGN as well. Now, you have to think about the first cycle because it sounds like an oxymoron. You are in the radio band, but you're detecting more radio quiet than radio loud. Why is that? Because the flux density is really faint. Radio loud AGN are intrinsically bright in the radio. So once you go really faint, you are going, you are running out of that. Look at the number counts. They are falling down. The radio quiet, being radio weak, are going to be fainter. And at certain point, they overtake radio loud. So it does, sounds like a, a, an inconsistency, but it makes perfect sense. To the message to the astronomer, and I always stress this when I give this talk, is that while at the mini Jansky level, Jansky level, the radio sky is dominated by jets, by black holes, below 0.1 mini Jansky, we are talking about star formation related processes, supernova remnants. So this is an important thing. I just almost have been going, going used to the fact that they look at the sky and they see jets. Only true about this value. Below this value, you're going to see mostly star forming gas. That's another main message to bring home, and it's a recent paper of our group. And the details are here. I'll, I'll, um, I'll skip this at this point, and I'm only showing this. Um, so, what we've done here? We've done a, a, we studied the evolution and the function of. AGN and star forming galaxies. Maximum likelihood method, a details are irrelevant. This is showing us the evolution versus the shape of the OC function. Okay. And the main message to bring home is that star forming galaxies in blue and the what AGN in green fall in the same region of parameter space. They evolve very strongly because this is one plus two to the 2.5, and people working on AGN know this is a a classical number, and they are a steep luminosity function. And the loud AGM are flat, and also they are evolving negatively. The message is that the required radio AGM behave like different beasts in the radio band. If you look at the luminosity function, this is the log luminosity function, ratio is zero, the radio quiet AGM fall on the extrapolation of the radio of star forming galaxies. They are the high end of star forming galaxies in the radio band. If they were mini radio the GN, they would be up there, but they're not. Okay? The shape is the same as star forming galaxies. So 
we believe that radio emission in radio wire GNs is star foolish related. A posteriori to me this is absolutely obvious. Why? Because radio radio GN are normal in elliptical galaxies, radio quark GN are in spirals, spirals full stars, these stars explode, become supernova, supernova remnants emit in the radio, and so the host galaxy around the radio quark GN is going to behave like a star forming galaxy. So absolutely trivial, a posteriori. It took 50 years to get here. But anyway, so a posteriori, to me, it makes perfect sense. Um, how do you explain the mini radio loud engineer you see? Well, in my view, this cores only make up 30% of the total, three quarters of the total. There, there is room for extended star formation related emission. And so, if you have two components, if you have a mini radio loud GM, which doesn't do much, and the star formation component, you can have a situation where low ratio. The J component dominates, I reshi the formation wins, and since our, our AGN are reshi 1.7, we actually see that in the radio band, the formation component dominates. It was very fast, you know, but the main message is that star formation, uh, the radio mission, the YGN, we believe, at least, at least at this ratio, is to do with star formation. Almost done, and then I get a couple of slides for the end. Now, whenever I give this talk to the astronomers, they say, okay, but this is all uh, suggestive, okay, but it could be a chance that uh, the evolution of the band is the same as the formation of the uh, total gas that you acquired. It doesn't prove anything. Now, well, I also have a student of mine, Margarita Bonzini, who's working on, uh, on this topic, and she did this. Star formation people might be interested in this. There are various ways of getting the star formation rate in star forming galaxies. And they depend on the band. This is plotting the star formation rate from the radio compared to the star formation rate from the far infrared. Remember that the starburst absorb the UV emission of the stars and they re emit it in the far infrared. So you actually you can get an idea of star formation rate, this is by the way. Star formation rate from the far infrared and you can compare with it. And this is well known if the famous far infrared correlation. And for transforming galaxies, they all follow this. What this is showing you is that most of the quality GNs also fall exactly on the same thing. The transformation rate you get from the two methods is the same. There are some AGNs which have more radio, and these are the ones where the, 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 the radio of the GN, the core at the end, the, GN, the center is stronger than the others. But this is the main message. If you put the radio loud GN there in red, as you can see, they are off because they have strong jets, and so their radio emission is much stronger. So the message for the people working on this is that when you compare the, the, the star formation rates in the two bands, radio quark, AGN, transforming galaxies fall on the same correlation. So again, we believe this is suggesting that, but no proving, I guess, that radio power of radio quality GM is the formation. I know you are exhausted. These are the references for, the, for this part. Um, OK, what do you think? Now, I can stop here. I have about five slides where I took about the AGM feedback, which they is going to cover in the afternoon. I can stop here and ask for questions and show you the last slide. Or I can quickly go through the so-called AGM feedback. So we can go to Who wants the JFT? No, 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 no. Mm, minority. <laughs> I have a question actually. Sorry? I have a question actually. Okay. Um, so, could you please comment on uh, the direction of evolution of uh, radio quiet and uh, radio loud agents? Do, do they behave in the same manner or is there a difference? Uh, we'll take it offline. It's very complicated. It depends on the back. Uh, we take it offline because the answer is very convoluted. In the radio band, they don't. At this far sense, they don't. The radio quality gen evolves as the phonic gases, the radio quality gen do not. Which is again showing that there are different things in the radio. But I, 
discuss with you later about the other ones. Um, okay, agent feedback. It's a hot topic. I've been working on AGN all my life. And until uh, about 10 years ago, AGN were thought to be uh, interesting but uh, freaks by the extractive community. Yeah, okay, they're nice, they're black holes, but you know, who cares? The real thing is galaxy evolution and how do you form the galaxies and star formation rates and all that. All this has changed in the past 10 years because of this work. It was realized that the AGN has a very strong influence on its own galaxy. This goes under the name of AGN FIBA. Um, the main method, this is not from Andy Fabian, is that, and I skip the details, the energy that the black hole can inject in the galaxy can be 100 times larger than the binding energy of the galaxy. So, so every AGN has the potential to disrupt its own galaxy. It doesn't happen always, otherwise it won't be here, there will be no galaxies, but the potential is there. The energy that AGN emits over its lifetime, which is easily related to the mass of the core, is so large that actually it can actually uh, destroy the gas. And so, people have changed their mind about AGN. Now they say, oh, they're really interesting because they can actually influence the evolution of the gas, see? And this is the, the two modes of AGN feedback. And uh, this is simulation by Tiziano Di Matteo allows theories to build ellipticals. Until 10 years ago, theories could not build ellipticals in their computers. Why? Because the galaxies kept forming stars. Now, when you put an AGN in the center, these are two spirals merging, becoming elliptical. The black holes are going to throw away all the gas. And at the end of the simulation, you are left with one big elliptical without gas, and so no star formation. Why? Only because there is a GN in the center and it's interacting and blowing away all the gas. So as you have been moved from the sideways to the, to the center of extraterrestrial astronomy because everybody agrees that they're important. Now, the details are extremely complicated, and therefore I think we have touched on them. On them but everybody agrees that AGN are important for the evolution of gas. So this is the end where you see all the gas being blown away. My colleague said this is simulation might be too simple, but very nice to look at. You start with two spirals full of gas, you end up with one elliptical, no gas, and no star formation, which is exactly what you see. Okay. Summary of the second part. Five minutes later. Ah, uh, okay, so we, I, I think you got it by now. <laughs> AGN meet all over the place, which is great. You know, I, I worked on all the bands, so when you get bored of one band, you move. And I publish papers, radio, infrared, optical, UV, x-ray, and gamma ray. So it's, and working on AGN is really cool, because you can, you can change your, your band whenever you want. This is another, one of the main things to remember. Different bands are going to sample a different physics and going to give us different windows into the AGN. This is really, really important. So when you read papers which talk about infrared samples or density samples or excited samples, remember this, that the various bands are related to different processes. So important, I'm going to summarize it again. So in the radio, uh, above the Nijansky, uh, we're seeing the jet, and below, this is roughly. You're seeing the transformation in those gas. In the infrared, in the near infrared band, you see in the torus, in the far infrared, star formation in the Earth's galaxy, and the jet in parentheses because in blazers, it's jet over the place. So, in the minority of the EGM, with the jets point towards us, it's jet, 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 jet in all bands. Optical UV, application disk, object, X ray, a question mark, something close to the disk. And jets for blazers. In the gamma rays, only jets. Okay, I'll never get tired of saying this. Astronomers, unfortunately, <laughs> seem to have a problem with selection effects. You should always be aware of how the sample was selected, 
the what sort of objects we are talking about. I see all sorts of things in the literature, and I won't make any names, but if you take the Sloan quasars and you want to study absorption, you have to remember that Sloan quasars are selected because of the UV axis. So, by definition, your sources are not going to be absorbed because they have a UV axis. So, if you want to study absorption in Sloan quasars, don't use them. This is another big message, I think, uh, which is that new, uh, I think we saw the puzzle which has been around for more than 50 years. And let me show you what is the end. I put a redshift 2 because this is where a sample is. A low redshift, things can be different. It's mostly due to star formation in the host galaxy, which makes perfect sense, but I said because these things are spirals, spirals are making stars. And this is what uh, they were with the standard form. Uh, the interaction between the GN and the Oscar, which is really, really important, but very complicated. And to finish, I'm going to do three questions, which I think everybody in the audience should work on, if you want to do something really, really important. The first one, we still don't know why some objects are either loud and the majority are required. We don't know. And also, maybe uh, Nectarius disagrees, uh, we still don't know really the details of how you launch a jet. We still don't know, I told you about the vibration mapping, broad night clouds, and like that. we still don't know what an AGN really look like on sub parsing scales. Are they broad line clouds in a disk? <coughs> are they in a spherical distribution? Are, in, are they in a way? We don't know. And there is, uh, second Andreas talked about interferometry yesterday, there are a bunch of papers coming out now doing near infinite interferometry, and there are surprises. Uh, this is a paper based uh, a study study to uh, AGN, and you know you're studying the torus, so you expect to see most of the emission coming from the torus. They see a lot of emission coming perpendicular to the torus, and what is that? I took one of the guys there uh, who actually is in garden. And he thinks that they might be seeing the internal part of the torus, the funnel, emitting in the infrared in the in the perpendicular direction of the torus. But that's just an idea. They're also puzzled. So the, the main point is that we still don't know what an agent really look like, looks like on the atmosphere. And this one I said it's important, but we don't know the details. We don't know how an AGN interacts with the Oscar. Uh, there is a book which came out actually this year, and uh, it's uh, in a funny format. It's a question and answer with about 50 researchers, including uh, yours truly here. And um, it's very easy. I mean, it was done for non specialists. It's quite thick, but I'm sure your library has it. And it's, it covers everything. I mean, it covers uh, all bands. Uh, uh, selection effects, uh, discovery of quasars, uh, future. And uh, you might find that you know, the, the level is, was done for people who are not experts. And then what I did, um, I put in the file all the references I, I put in the two lectures uh, with the author's uh, title and the ADS link. I'm going to give them to uh, Norris. And so you can actually double click and you'll be taken to the paper, you can download it and, uh, and have a look at it. And thank you very much.